please state your emergency. Um, my mom, she's crying. Why is she crying? My dad, she's hitting her. Welcome back to Behind Closed Doors. Now let's take a look at what first responders encounter after a domestic violence call is made. The Phoenix Fire Crisis Response Team responded to 76 domestic violence incidents during the months of June through August 2013. The majority were female adults and they knew their attackers. It's not reported by a neighbor or the victim themselves, then again that victim um, is, is, is being terrorized in their own home. It's something that um, they're doing everything they can just to survive, uh, and survive the next day uh, when, they're, when it's somebody that's supposed to love them is the person that's committing crimes against them uh, on a nightly basis. Once a 911 call is made, police arrive, and oftentimes Phoenix Fire Crisis Response Team follows, providing information and resources for victims. The Community Assistance Program is a division of the fire department and one of the programs um, that we manage in that division is the crisis response units and those are 24-hour uh, units that respond to any type of a crisis uh, within the city and we can be automatically dispatched to an incident or we can be special called by um, any firefighter or police officer to assist them when they need help. A big part of our program is serving victims of crime. So many of the victims that we serve could be victims of um, domestic violence, sexual assault, could be survivors of um, homicide victims. So there's often times where the police officers might be on scene and they call a crisis team to come out because they have a mom and her children that have been assaulted in their home. Um, either the suspect is going to be arrested or is no longer around and they don't know where he is and so then it's not a safe situation. Hi, my name is Michelle. I work with the Phoenix Fire Department Crisis Response Team. We're here to provide you with some support. So we'll talk to the victim about um, the possibilities of finding a shelter, going to a shelter. We'll help them with that process, help them with transportation, um, help them go to a hotel if they need to, um, find other family support systems for them to utilize um, so that we can go over a safety plan with them and, and resources for them and try to encourage them to um, you know, do what's best for them and their family. The crisis response team goes through extensive training on how to deal with victims of domestic violence. Carolina Grimaldi is a volunteer. All, every call that you go on is different. Um, and depending on the situation, um, I may be affected by the calls um, more so than others. And it just, I mean, looking at the person's environment and where they're coming from and knowing if they have more of a support system, then I'm okay emotionally. If I know that this individual doesn't have a strong support system or may go back into the situation, um, I may be a little more affected by it. Domestic violence impacts everyone, including first responders. Remember, public safety is here to help. The city's Family Advocacy Center is a safe place to get help. Joining us now is Director Libby Bissa and Sergeant Mark Rivers with Family Investigations. Thank you both for joining us today. Thanks. It's nice seeing you both. So Mark, define domestic violence for us. Well, domestic violence falls under the umbrella in Arizona Revised Statutes and state law. And really what it, uh, what it is is it encompasses any number of crimes that fall within uh, some type of family relationship, whether it be a husband, wife, a boyfriend, girlfriend, or uh, roommates even, um, brothers and sisters. Any type of familial rela relationship is, uh, would fall under domestic violence. And the crimes could consist of anything from you know, a misdemeanor assault to a felony assault. Uh, to criminal damage, uh, threatening and intimidating, harassment, uh, things of that nature. So there's a number of crimes that fall under the domestic violence umbrella and, and a number of relationships that fall under that umbrella as well. And it's just recent too, where we had the relationships before, it was between uh, a spouse and now it could be the boyfriend, girlfriend or li partners living together. That's correct, yeah. Right. They just added that to statute uh, a couple years ago and it was, it was a great addition in our belief uh, to the statute to help protect those victims that are in, in an intimate relationship with someone that weren't necessarily protected by the state law right. regarding domestic violence. That's right, too. And I, and I want to note out to our viewers, too, we've been talking pretty, pretty much domestic violence and, and spousal boyfriend, girlfriend, but it's so out there, too, for boyfriend, girlfriends, uh, two partners, heterosexual, homosexual. I mean, it, it is out there. Absolutely. 
So Libby, where does a Family Advocacy Center come in? You do so, so much for our community and for those victims in need. Uh, give us a broad brush of your mission. Well, the Family Advocacy Center was established predominantly to serve victims of domestic and sexual violence. And the intent is that a victim can come to one location and receive a myriad of uh, services and to participate with law enforcement, work with them if they so choose, or to perhaps get counseling, um, to get an order of protection, to uh, do some safety planning, to have crisis intervention services. Um, we also have some long-term case management at the center and we provide some support groups. So the idea is that a victim can come into one location and not have to go from our location down to the courthouse or then down to the police department or then over to another place for counseling so that they can go to just one place. It's very uh, familiar to them, it's very quiet, it's calming, and it's safe. Now, a victim, once they do make it, uh, that initial contact with you, too, um, they're assigned a caseworker or case manager right at the top? Right. We have victim advocates on site, and um, once a victim comes in, they'll be assigned a victim advocate, and that person will walk them through the system, however they cho choose to, um, to work within that system. If they want to work with the police department and make or um, reports or mm -hmm. if they choose to just deal with whatever their situation is without involving the police department, we can assist them with that too. Excellent. Now, we both just saw the, the CRT team, uh, the crisis response team, how police and fire do in fact work together after that 911 call is made. Um, Mark, let's, let's go to you. How, how, how difficult is it, is it to make an arrest or just investigate, you know, a, a that, that, that initial call. It's one of the most difficult uh, aspects in, in law enforcement as far as the domestic violence uh, problem as a whole in getting victims to, to, uh, to understand the situation they're in and to cooperate with law enforcement all the time knowing that in, in many cases if they cooperate with law enforcement they're going to be you know there may be some punishment by their loved one uh, for cooperating with us. Um, you know unfortunately these victims especially victims are in, uh, involved in a relationship involving co uh, course of control uh, are in harm's way 24 hours a day seven days a week and really it's the only crime that the that law enforcement investigates where those victims are truly in harm's way all the time. And you know, I want to I want to zone in on that control because we, we just heard from two victims at the top of the show talking about the, the mental the physical uh, uh, abuse but uh, that, that control factor of, of a boyfriend, a girlfriend, uh, a spouse, you know, not letting you call your friends, your parents, you know, uh, texting, what, where, where are you? That is a form of domestic violence, correct? Absolutely, and sometimes the most serious form. Um, many times... That's how it starts. Uh, absolutely, and many times what we find is that um, suspects that are engaged in, in a pattern of course of control, uh, they may not physically abuse their, their, their significant other. What they do is they use a, a acts of in intimidation, isolation, and control to control that victim's every every being. So um, many times, and that's why it's so important to investigate those misdemeanor crimes to stop it before it gets to a felony level, um, where the victim is is now really in significant danger due to to the amount of violence involved. Many times, what we see is in misdemeanor cases, if we can make an impact early on in that in that in that family relationship. Uh, in holding that offender accountable that many times that victim's able to seek safety someplace else and, and move on with their life. And I gotta tell you, social media has gotta play a major role in what's going on as far as intimidation, manipulation, control, looking at Texas, looking at Facebook, all that I'm sure comes into a major, major role. It certainly does. We see it every yeah. single day. Yeah, God, so unfortunate. Let me, let's go back to you. Again, all this great work you do at the Family Advocacy Center. Um, we um, are gonna go to a, uh, uh, our forensic nurses. We spent actually the morning with them to take a look at uh, what they do at your center to help um, victims once they've made that 911 call and you've taken them to the center. Let's go to this package now. Okay, and I'm gonna have you just tilt your head back and we'll look at the roof of your mouth. The Forensic Nurse Unit at the Family Advocacy Center is a very specialized team of 26 women. Tiffany Kirby is one of 26 from the Scottsdale Healthcare Center. She explains their role. Forensic Nurse Examiner is a uh, registered nurse who's been specially trained to provide care to victims of interpersonal violence, like those uh, victims of sexual assault and domestic violence strangulation. So we provide medical care um, and add the forensic side to that uh, as well. Erin, can you tell me why you're here to see me today? He choked me. The exam process itself is um, asking, asking my patient why, they, why they're there to see me. What, 
what has happened to them. They then give me a history of the assault that has occurred. And from there, that, that guides my exam. That lets me know where to look and, and how to care for them. From there, the head to toe exam takes place, literally going right from head to toe head. on my patient, looking for and documenting any injury that they may have. Uh, in addition to documented on body maps and injury logs, I also photograph all that injury. Once um, that's done, I also collect potential evidence or swabs from the parts of the body that may have potential DNA as a result of that assault. Documenting injury and collecting evidence is vital for the police investigation and potentially aiding in prosecuting the alleged assailant. Did he have a weapon? No. Unfortunately, Tiffany has seen repeat victims all too often. Domestic violence strangulation is prevalent. I think what we found and what we agreed on as a group is that we weren't addressing the issue effectively. Hence the, the building and of, of this uh, this new approach with the medical forensic exams and, and working with law enforcement and the county attorney's office. According to the Family Advocacy Center, 50 percent of domestic violence strangulation does not have any visible injury. Some symptoms could be sore throat, headache, coughing, difficult swallowing. Visible injury includes bruising, scrapes, broken blood vessels, swelling, and general redness. Being a forensic nurse is difficult, but rewarding. It can be very trying. Um, we, we feel like, uh, as nurses who do this type of work, we feel like we're making a difference, and we feel like we're helping people, and I think that's what helps keep our sanity. Uh, we have a wonderful support system between us. In addition to medical care, working with the Family Advocacy Center, the nurses provide resources to aid victims of violence. Okay, Erin, that's all for the exam, but what I want you to have and what I think is very important is the safety plan. And what this is, is it's kind of like when we, when we make a plan or when we prepare for a trip or for a birthday party, we put a lot of thought and detail into that. And this safety plan does the same for you in, in ensuring your safety. So it makes you write down where your car keys will be if you need them, it, what, what your best route out of your house may be, and where, who to contact once should the assailant come back to you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I would like you to take that and look over that. Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions for me? I don't think so, thank you so much. Okay, you're very welcome. Now here are some additional tips for a safety plan. Safety is a priority. Identify trusted friends or family. Pack important items. Designate a safe place. Teach children how to dial 911. Have a family code word for danger. If you or someone you know is a victim of domestic violence, call the Family Advocacy Center today at 602-534 2120. And always, if it's an emergency, call 911. The forensic nurses are a special breed and they do in fact assist so much in your work. How has that relationship work? Uh, it's been fantastic. It's, it's fairly new to us at the Phoenix Police Department. It's something that the Maricopa County Attorney's Office started um, about a year ago, I believe, and it's uh, now part of the Phoenix Police Department. It's really helped us uh, to be able to prosecute crimes of strangulation that prior to, you know, a couple years ago wasn't even a felony, it wasn't a felony crime. And now with the way that the nurses are forensically trained, and first and foremost, they're there to treat the patient, uh, to provide medical care to them. And at the same time, they're also documenting injuries that we can use in the course of our investigation to help show that this victim truly was, uh, was strangled. And in many cases, those, uh, those, things aren't those types of injuries aren't visible to the naked eye. As we just saw too, now tell me, strangulation on the rise, it's decreased, where are we with that? Because you know what? You always have your weapons. Right, and, and they're in your hands. And I think it's always been there, but now that that it's uh, now that it's a felony, um, and we have the nurse the forensic nurse examiners that that, that treat the victims, um, I think we see it more on, more often now, just because it's there's there's more uh, um, awareness. Awareness, exactly, right. more awareness. Right, right. 
Um, at the end of this piece, too, we just saw Libby to uh, where the nurses do assist, and this is, of course, a part of the FAC on the safe, uh, having a safe plan. Talk a little bit about that and go a little more in, in detail about having a safety plan. Well, the, uh, the advocates that we have at the center work with every victim to, whether it's a small safety plan because they're, they're not living with a perpetrator or they're not in a, in a position of harm, or maybe they are living with that person or they need to escape and we're developing an escape plan and we're developing an entire comprehensive plan on how to be safe, how to keep their family safe and themselves. Um, it, so we have a, a three or four page document that we will actually work through with them that will give them ideas on things that they can do when they're in their home. Um, they may have left the perpetrator, but there's still things that they need to be aware of in their home, places to go, places that are safe, places that maybe are not as safe if they had to run for, for fear um, if someone was in the house with them. But um, we're, we're able to walk around their, their, their residence kind of in their mind and think about the different things that they can do to ma remain safe and the things that they cannot do that will equally keep them safe. So, you know, things like maybe they don't walk to their car alone. Maybe they're, they just have a heightened awareness of their situation and their environment. Um, I think that in general, that's just a really good thing for all of us to have, but, but even more so for a victim of domestic violence. And I want to point out again, too, that the whole essence of technology is it can work against a person, it can work mm -hmm. for a person. Technology, somebody has GPS on your phone. Again, they're reading your texts. They know exactly where you are. They're reading your email. They're tracking all that. So mm -hmm. again, and I know you have on your website, if they try to go in there, that to click a special button to say so they cannot track that. I think that's so key. That's wonderful. It's great that you guys are doing that work. I want to thank you both for being with us today. Um, Family Advocacy Center for everything you do to help uh, so, so many people, both men and women. Sergeant Rivers, thank you for all your work you do too um, out in the community on a day-to-day -day basis and, and, and helping um, all those victims. We really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Up next, we'll take a look at prosecution, courts, and the Victim Advocacy Program. You're watching Behind Closed Doors.